52. And while you're turning there, you might look for a little piece of paper or something as a marker. <clears throat> because as usual, we're going to go check this out in the historical books. So Psalm 52. And um, <clears throat> this class and uh, the next one will be our last one for this course. So I intentionally tried to spend absolutely no time in the Word or before the Lord so that nothing new would kick up. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, Psalm 52, we're going to begin with, uh, oh wait, y'all hear that? Santa Claus. He's early. <laughs> He's early. <clears throat> uh, Psalm 52. Notice uh, the, uh, the uh, superscription above the, the psalm itself. <clears throat> to the chief musician, Maskeel, a psalm of David, when Doeg, the Edomite, came and told Saul and said unto him, David is come to the house of Ahimelech. All right. So before we can as usual, understand this psalm, where he's coming from, we have to know the historical background. And that historical background is found in 1 Samuel, chap beginning in chapter 21. Part of it's in chapter 22. <clears throat> and this is um, the initial stages of David when he starts to run. This is before... He goes to the Philistines, which we covered that psalm. This is before he ends up at the cave, Abdullah. <clears throat> this is at the very beginning when he starts to run from, from King Saul. And um, so chapter 21 and verse 1. Then came David to Nob, <clears throat> to Ahimelech the priest, and one of the things I want you to notice <clears throat> is he's coming to the priest, and there he will he'll eat the showbread and whatever. So that means that the tabernacle is now in the city of Nob. Okay. We found it in our studies. We found that it's been in um, Shiloh. We found that the, it's been in Gibeon. <clears throat> but now it is in the city of Nob, okay? So just so you know that the tabernacle moved around uh, before he found his resting place in Zion. And this was, um, this was still part of the problem because the, even though they had entered the land, the ark had not found rest yet. So, uh, again, verse... Uh, one, then came David to Nob to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him, Why art thou alone and no man with thee? And David said unto Ahimelech <coughs> the priest, The king hath commanded me a business and hath, made, and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business about which I send thee and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Um, now, therefore, what is under thy hand, give me five loaves of bread in my hand, or what there is present. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing to notice is, this is David even earlier than with the Philistines when he let spit run down his face and was clawing the gate at the, at the, the uh, what was it, city of Gath or one of them, the Philistines town. This is even before that. <clears throat> So David isn't really much of a man of God here. He's lying flat out. And, and the truth is, and I'll just tell you, this may be hard for some of you to realize, but um, you can be put in circumstances and the survival instinct kicks in. <laughs> and you might do things or say things that you don't think you would ever do. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Or, or just about all of them, really, and uh, and the and um, 
you know, at a certain stage, that's okay, but we are to grow up into Christ. And it's not a matter of <clears throat> our integrity. I think we need stuff like that to prove that we really don't have any integrity apart from Christ. I mean, really, I do. I think that we need failures and bad ones that shame us almost, almost to the point where we have to look to the Lord and we realize the depth of our depravity. <clears throat> and so, and of course, again, remember, this follows right on the heels of the acting like a lunatic and stuff like that. So, and, and not only that, but, you know, it's never a good idea to lie to the priest. You know, I'm just thinking. <laughs> and that's who he was talking to here. <clears throat> um, and then in verse 4, And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under mine hand, but there is hallowed bread. If the young men have kept themselves at least from women. And David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out. And the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common. <clears throat> Yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. So the priest gave him hallowed bread, for there was no bread there but the show bread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. And so um, Jesus makes reference to this situation. And when he's being accused, um, and he says, how is it that David was able to eat the showbread when it was not lawful for him to do? And the deal was the priests and the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they had no answer because they strictly moved along the lines of the law and didn't understand <coughs> um, God's calling, God's dealing, and let me just say this, and the fact that that old, good old saying that is used from time to time, God is not finished with me yet. And, and that's just a fact. He's not, he's not. And he certainly wasn't with David. This was the very early beginning of real dealing in his life. <clears throat> Verse 7, now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. And his name was Doag, an Edomite, the chiefest of the herdsmen that belonged to Saul. And so we see several things here. We see that there is an Edomite. And does anybody know where the Edomites came from? Esau. And so he's, you know, he is clearly not of the chosen seed. Uh, not only that, but he's of <clears throat> one that uh, to this day they still... Uh, fight and have uh, differences. But he is one of the servants of Saul. He is one of the chiefest, in fact, the chiefest of his herdsmen, and also he's over men. Um, and he's there that day. He happens to be there. Uh, he, he was there because he got detained before the Lord. He wasn't just moving right along. God detained him. And, and David said unto Ahimelech, And is there not under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapon with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Eli, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it. For there is no other except that here. And David said, there is none like that. Give it to me. All right. <clears throat> and um, when he leaves, the next verse is he leaves. And where does he go? Well, he goes to Achish. Sorry. It, uh, he goes to uh, Achish, the king of Gath. And this whole story we've already been through and other psalms that refer to it. <clears throat> but now we want to skip down to... Uh, Let's see, uh, 1 Samuel 22, uh, 
let's see, verse 9. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, who was set over the servants of Saul. So notice that he wasn't just over the herdsmen. He was set over the servants of Saul. And he said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. And he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Then the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahiatub, and all of his father's house, the priests who were in Nob, and they came all of them to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Ahiatub. And he answered, Hear my, my lord. And Saul said unto him, <clears throat> Why have you conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse, in that thou hast given him bread and a sword, and hast inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as at this day? Then ah Ahiatub answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, who is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable in thine house. So the priest has no clue that this falling out has taken place. And the only reputation he knows of David is the one that, well, clearly, I mean, this guy is faithful. In fact, he says, who is faithful compared to all of your servants? But not only that, but you gave your daughter to him. And, um, <clears throat> and he's honorable in all thine house. He's, he, just, he doesn't know what's going on, and he's just been hit in the face with, why are you conspiring against me? Why are you doing this? Why are you trying to help him so he can rise against me? And everything within the priests are thinking, David is an honorable man from what they know. <clears throat> you may. That is a good question. Because, but you know, all it says is that he was afraid when he saw that he was alone. It didn't say, you know, I, I mean, the wording there at least says that. So it's almost like. Mine says when he met David. Hmm. Huh. So I, 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 I was wondering if sure. he maybe had an inkling that. Right. Well, he may have. He may have. <clears throat> but I'm sure that this answer here is correct also yeah, yeah. in that he knows that he is one of the top men of, of Saul. Well, yep. That's a possibility. Yeah, that's a possibility also. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Verse 15, did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. Let not the king impute or put on my account anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father, for thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. Um, so, so one of the parts of this accusation is that the priest inquired of God for David. And that hacked off Saul, okay, you know. And, uh, and so the priest says, I didn't know anything about that, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't inquire of God for David. And the king said, thou shalt surely die. That's his immediate response to him saying forthrightly that I didn't know anything about it. I wasn't working with David. And the king said, thou shalt surely die. Ahimelech, thou, and all thy father's house. <clears throat> and then uh, just this last part, and the king said unto the footmen that stood about him, turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David. And because they knew, and because they knew when he fled, and did not show it to me, but the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. Now I'm sure there are several reasons for that sure one is my lord has anybody ever turned on the priests of god and were they not trained their whole life to respect these people number two 
look at what Saul is saying to them, and they're, pro they're standing close enough where they can hear this conversation. And the conversation went as it did, and then he says, slay them because their hand is also with David, because they knew when he fled and did not show it unto me. And they're all kind of going, he just said they didn't know more or less of the whole situation. Uh, don't we need a little better, you know, jury here than just you, <clears throat> boss? And uh, so, uh, but the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. So you could say that the Lord is higher than the priests. And the Lord is higher than the king. And they would not fall upon the priests of the Lord. Okay? And then, <clears throat> and the king said to Doeg, Turn now and fall upon the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priests, and he slew on that day fourscore and five persons who did wear a linen ephod. So fourscore and five is how many? Eighty-five. That's a lot. <clears throat> and, um, Nob, the city of the priests, smote he with the edge of the sword. So he'd called them to him, but he goes and he smites this city also. <clears throat> and uh, he smote with the edge of the sword both men and women and children and suckling, that means little babies, and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. And one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahiatab, named Abathar, escaped and fled after David. Now, isn't that interesting? Of all the places he could go, he goes after David. I mean, because, you know, isn't this all David's fault? Or is it? And so... Um, in verse 22, And David said unto Abathar, I knew it that day when Doag the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy fa thine father's house. Now, <clears throat> all right, let's, uh, let's go back to Psalm. And keep your place here because we may need it, but, you know, um, Psalm 52. And... Um, you see that David's immediate response was to take the blame upon himself. Um, that is a load of guilt and hard to live with that good men, that godly men, that uh, babies, that a whole city is struck down um, you know, the weight of that uh, had to weigh incredibly upon David. And David got the news from Abathar, the only priest that escaped. And, um, and David's words were, I have occasioned the death of, of all these people. Um, you know... Psalm 52 is going to show us another view. The history shows us one view, but Psalm 52 is going to show us another view. It's going to show David after he gets with God over the situation. And let me say, um, you know, I've said this before, but good people die in war. And this is war with an enemy. And good people die. I mean, we always want, you know, just the bad people to die. But good people die. People that stand up for God. People that mean something uh, to the kingdom of God. Uh, they lose their life. They lose their life. But the good thing is, is that if, you, if you're living according to Christ, if you're living according to the Lamb, nobody's murdering you. Nobody's taking your life. Nobody is, is doing that. You are giving your life. If you do not have that mentality, you're being robbed and you're going to want to react back. Okay. But if you do have that mentality, <clears throat> um, 
you know, I was watching uh, this thing on the TV about the, the barbarians that, that, that were hitting Europe, you know, right at the sort of the decline of the Roman Empire. And, and uh, <clears throat> it was the, primarily the Vikings from Scandinavia that were coming, and I mean, just running rampant. And they'd, they'd go to all of these monasteries and stuff and just kill off all the monks because there wasn't anybody to stand and fight take all of their, their, their gold and silver crosses and stuff and all of that stuff, anything that they had, and they would take that. <clears throat> and uh, they would just rampage, and they'd kill everybody. And, um, and it was like a, a scourge th across uh, Britain and across Europe. And uh, there was just like nothing they could do to stop them. And, and the main problem was, is they had these long boats and they could literally go down all those rivers of Europe and there are a ton of rivers that they could go down and just land anywhere they wanted to and attack any place at any time and then leave because they would just hit and run and then go, you know, off. And so there was no, there was no big army there so that these guys could gather a big army and do this. It was an impossible situation. And so for... Years and years and years and years and years, they kept just doing this and killing all, and you know, really killing off all the quote unquote church people. <clears throat> and uh, the end of them came about 200 years later, um, at about 200 years after their first big raid, where the leaders started getting saved and they started telling all the other Vikings that you need to come to God. This needs to be our God from now on. And that literally ended the whole thing. You know, I'm sorry, I think, I often think about the, the Gulf War and all the stuff going on and I, I often wonder how long things can drag out and yet how short they could be if certain things were done in a certain way. But you have to believe in that, and most people don't. Most people don't. So, you know, you do it the way, you do it the, way the heathen do it. You do it the way anybody else does it. <clears throat> All right. So, um, um, David in Psalm 52 starts getting with the Lord. Thank God. Can anybody say thank God? Because let me tell you something. <clears throat> One of the tactics of the enemy is to beat you down with guilt. Beat you down with guilt. There are a lot of methods, but he will try to put all the blame on you. You know, I'm going to tell you straight up, this is why some people blame everybody else for everything, because if they don't, all that comes back on them. The enemy will try to put all the blame on you, and instead of putting it on everybody else so that the enemy gets off your case, the answer is to get with the Lord and to see from God's point of view, to truly see what God's view of this is. <clears throat> um, and uh, so I wrote in the historical account, we get David's human response, but in the, in the Psalm 52, uh, we see how he deals with it. Um, David sees the true reason for the death of the priests. And it is the wicked, which is Saul and Doag. And remember, they're two heads off the same beast, just different aspects of it. Uh, but I also thought it interesting that David would call them the wicked or the oppressor. But he never named anybody except in this superscription up here. But he never really wouldn't call them that. Um, he would just sing a song pertaining to that kind of stuff. So let's look at uh, verse 1. <clears throat> Why boastest thou thyself in mischief? And here is a key little phrase here. O mighty man. And you'll see this run in particularly. It'll open up like a flower at the end of this psalm. What David's trying to get at. He's talking about somebody who has power, somebody who has ability, somebody who has uh, within their uh, uh, grasp the ability to do certain things. They're a mighty person. 
and they use that power to get back at people, to strike at people that they call their enemies. They weren't given power to be used against other people, but they used it to whatever degree. And there are people that have little bitty jobs and little bitty places that have one little area that's their source of power, and they'll run over the top of you with it. One little area, because, but, but if, you, if you put them in, in the position of Hitler, you give them that much power, if they use that in that little realm as much as they can to get their way and whatever, then they would use all of that power to, to bow their enemies and to hurt people that they feel like hurt them. You can be assured of that. They're no different. It's just that God has restricted and limited their power. But, the, but he's speaking here of Saul and he's speaking here of Doeg. Oh, why boastest thou thyself in thy mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth forever. <clears throat> um, the state of the wicked man that he boasts himself over the righteous is that he, he boasts because he's a mighty man. He has power to hurt. Um, he, he's got power to hurt David. He's got power to kill priests and to carry out mischief. But he gets to do it all in the name of being a valuable servant to the king. There's your key right there. That justifies it. That justifies it. I'm doing valuable work for the king. You see, folks, something in us has to be right. If it's not right, I'm telling you, we're, we will do the exact same thing. Something in us has to be right. And that one thing that has to be right is Christ. We have to be conformed to his image because if we're not, we will use all the methods that they use. And uh, to whatever degree that we can get away with it, we'll get away with it too. Um, so he's a mighty man. He feels strong and he feels superior. <clears throat> and then verse 2, Thy tongue deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor working deceitfully. <clears throat> And of course, uh, you you remember you remember what uh, let's see what was it uh, what Saul said. Um, he said, uh, Doag is saying all this stuff that uh, he inquired of the Lord for him, which was not true. And he gave him provisions, but he gave him the showbread. And he gave him the sword that belonged to him. But he's making it sound all this way. And of course, then when uh, Saul responds, his response is, why have you conspired against me? You know. What is the old saying? It's not paranoia if everyone really is out to get you. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, and he's saying that he's inquired of the Lord for him that he should rise against me to lie in wait. That that was why he inquired of the Lord. That David wouldn't be pure enough to say, Lord, help me. Show me your heart. Show me your way. No, Saul assumes that the inquiring of the Lord was simply so that he could overthrow and rise up above Saul. And that that's... Now, where would... Where would someone come up with that kind of motive for someone else? That's whatever's in their own heart. They assume that that's the way everybody is. And they assume, Saul's assuming, well, David's the same way. You know, they say something like, well, that's what I do. <laughs> yeah, but not everybody is uh, unconformed. Not everybody is unconformed. <clears throat> And so, uh, in this verse, it speaks of Saul who spoke deceitfully of David and of others, of the priests. It accused priests of knowingly conspiring against him, plotting secret plans with David, giving Saul's enemy divine guidance, and it paints King Saul as a victim and all others as being the wicked. Now, this is where it gets confusing because if you listen to Saul, he's just a poor victim. Are you with me? And if you listen to David, it might sound like he's a victim. 
you got to hear from the Lord. You got to hear from the Lord. You can't go by what anybody tells you. You know? <clears throat> um, now, I'll move on. Verse, uh, well, first of all, notice uh, verse 2 thy tongue devises mischief like a sharp razor working deceitfully. Thou lovest evil more than good and lying rather than to speak righteousness. Um, so the problem isn't their circumstances, it's their heart. Okay? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And it says that they actually love evil. And they love it more than good. Now what is evil and what is more than good? They love lying if it puts them in a better light than speaking the right thing. Did you hear that? You see, because when we read that, we say, well, they love evil more than good. They love, uh, uh, what is, they actually, let's say, they love it more than good. They love lying. But who would ever admit and say, I love lying or I love evil? Nobody. But when you say, now, who, who would, who would say something to put you in a better light? And therefore, and maybe the method to get you in a better light is to put them in a worse light. Well, that strikes at the heart of all of us. And that's exactly what it's speaking about. That's the kind of thing that it's speaking of. Um, let's see, and then verse 4, Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. What I like here is he's calling them a tongue. Oh, thou deceitful. He's saying, you're a tongue. <laughs> oh, thou deceitful tongue. You are a tongue. That's what your main thing is. That's your main tool. That's your main thing that you're using. You are a tongue. <clears throat> they love devouring words, it says. Words that eat up and destroy people. In other words, they don't love their enemies. They love devouring their enemies. <laughs> Is there a slight difference there? <laughs> love your enemies, love devouring your enemies. I think there's a whole world of difference, a whole new creation contrast of difference there. Um, uh, I, but they love devouring them and trampling them down with words. It is the tongue. It is using it deceitfully. <clears throat> that means that is turning things to fit their side and to make others to look bad. And then verse 5, God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. And uh, God shall likewise destroy, meaning as you are doing, as you are destroying, that's going to come back on you just as you destroy. So the wicked will be destroyed, but they'll be destroyed in the same manner that they have used. Tongues will destroy them, but not the tongues of the righteous. Other people will rise up and speak things. And as David was plucked out of his homeland, and he was plucked from his dwelling place, they shall get the same thing, but on a higher level, obviously. Uh, they will be plucked out of the land of the living rooted out. They shall be plucked out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. And then verse uh, 6, the righteous also shall see it and fear and shall laugh at him. They shall fear and laugh. You know, sometimes, have you ever been afraid and so you laughed a little bit? <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? You, you're afraid and you sort of giggle, you know, it's sort of a nervous laugh or whatever. Um, uh, those who I wrote, those who hold to God's right path, which is the Lamb, the Lamb shall see what happens, fear, and even laugh at those who think that they can get away with such things. But here's what they'll laugh. Verse seven shows you what they laugh. Lo, this is the man who made God, made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself. In his wickedness. All right. So what is that saying? 
This is the mighty man it began with in verse 1. <clears throat> this is the one, this is the man. Who are we talking about? Who? Come on. Who are we talking about here? I'll tell you exactly who we're talking about. We're not talking about Doag. We're not talking about Saul. We're not talking about necessarily you or me. We're talking about the man who made not God his strength, who depended on his own strength or looked to other means to strengthen himself. Um, <clears throat> this is the man, it says. He trusted in the abundance of what he had, what he, the, the riches or the things, because money has a power with it. And whatever thing that it can get your way, he trusted in that. Whoever this person is, whether that be you, me, or whatever, it is the man who, who trusted not and made not God his strength. And he strengthened himself in his wickedness, and, and this happens where you get away with something that really you shouldn't have done, and then God doesn't immediately strike you. So guess what? What do you do? You go, well, I, you go a little further with it. And then eventually you think God doesn't even notice and you can, you can just do whatever you want and nobody's ever going to notice. But, you know, what you're doing is strengthening yourself in your own wickedness. <clears throat> um, I wrote, uh, this is what they will laugh. This man was his own strength who trusted in his riches and because of this pursue, pursued even stronger in his way. The problem with these kind of people is not specific acts of sin, but not finding the Lord as everything, but relying on ways to get what they want that is not the Lord. Uh, people say of us, we're very small now, people say of us, all you ever do is talk about the Lord. All you ever do is you know, you just always talking that you want the Lord and whatever. Uh, you know, this is saying that these who didn't strengthen themselves in the Lord, these who learned to just trust in the things that they've had and make their own way and not find that the Lord is everything and not relying on the Lord to get what they want, but whatever means, whatever means, and, and I've often thought, if someone is willing to not go with the Lord to get what they want, if, if the Lord isn't going to get me this, if the Lord won't help me get this, I'll get it through coming around this way. I'll enter in some other way, and I'll get it from this angle, or, or I'll do this. Well, folks, if you try enough ways and still don't get what you want, but you still want it, you might go so far as even to turn to the enemy, the devil. Literally, the devil. That's what Saul did. King Saul eventually did that because he, he kept trying all of his ways and stuff, and they weren't coming about. And then, um, finally, verse, well, verse 8 and 9. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. He's planted there. He's, his roots are solidly in the Lord. <clears throat> um, I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. Now, don't you believe that Doag and David made mistakes, messed up, sinned? Do you believe they both did? Yeah. But remember, the problem was that Doag and Saul wouldn't make God their strength. They wouldn't make God their strength. They trusted in other means. But David is saying... Man, I, I, I'm trusting in God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. <laughs> Does that sound like a good line? I trust in God's mercy forever and ever and ever. I'm never going to stop trusting in his mercy. <clears throat> um, and the point being, too, that he didn't trust in himself. The whole point of these other guys is they trust in their self. They trust in their riches. They trust in their might. They trust in their position. And David said, I will trust in the Lord and in his mercy. God will take care of me. Um, and then finally, verse 9, I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it, and I will wait on thy name, for it is good before thy saints. 
notice the words, because thou hast done it. Make me to trust in your life and your mercy, because thou hast done it. I trust in you because you'll do it. I trust in your mercy because if you don't do it, I'll fail. Do you see how that's, both are trusting in the Lord. I trust in your life because thou hast done it. I trust in your mercy because I didn't. <laughs> I won't put my hand to it, but I will wait on you. All right. We're going to go ahead and stop right there. And uh, the next class, I think, will be uh, sort of short. And we should be able to get out of here early, Lord willing. That's why it's seat. I didn't, I didn't pray over class. I didn't spend any time in the Word for you so that we could get out of here early. Are you happy? Let's, let's take a break and we'll come back.